Hi, welcome. My name is Camila Vitaitis and I am a program assistant with the Colorado Conservatory for the Jazz Arts or CCJA, as many of you know. Um, this is our weekly interview and masterclass series called CCJA Sundays. And we've had such an amazing lineup of interviews over the past few months. And that's thanks in great part to Colin Stranahan who helps curate the series. So thank you, Colin. And um, tonight I am thrilled to be speaking with an amazing guitarist, vocalist and composer. And we happen to share a name except for one L. And uh, this is Camila Meza. Thank you, Camila, for being here. Hi, Camila. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great <clears throat> to be sharing this time and space with you. Thanks for the invitation, Colleen and Camila as well. Yeah, thank you so much. You said you're in Guatemala right now? Mm -hmm. I'm in Central America, Guatemala. Um, I've been here for <clears throat> a few months. Um, right now it's the starting of the rainy season. So we might get some, some crazy storm sound soon. <laughs> Eventually. Wow. We yeah. just had snow here this weekend, so. Oh, you did? All right. Did you, you decided to go there during COVID, like because of the pandemic? Um, yeah, partly. Um, I, <clears throat> I left New York um, around the time that everything started, started collapsing. I had a few, well, not a few, I had a, a bunch of tours and and things going on with uh, my album that was released in 2019 with the nectar orchestra mm -hmm. and yeah i mean as as everybody probably in the music world uh march last last year was like yeah everything started crumbling down and and so the first reaction was to go to family i'm sure a lot of people also that was their destiny and so I stayed in Wyoming for a few months with uh, my partner's family, um, which was a, a really beautiful experience, totally unexpected to be able to spend so much time, you know, uh, with his side of the family, because he's like, I mean, Wyoming, we don't go there for tours a lot. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but then, yeah, more kind of like in the adventurous, uh, constant discovery uh, soul that I have, that we have, uh, this kind of came into the picture and it's been amazing as I was mentioning, like, um, I mean, I personally was craving nature, you know, and I knew, I mean, it was kind of soon after everything started looking very, very difficult, you know, you could tell that in terms of movement and all that, it was going to be really tough. And and honestly, I had been craving nature even before the pandemic. Like I was, I was, there was something in my gut telling me like, whoa, you need to put your hands in the soil. You need to, to reconnect with um, kind of like other ways, you know? Yeah. Or ancient ways. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you mentioning nature reminds me of that beautiful music video. I don't remember the name of the tune, but I was watching it today. It's such a beautiful, just like scenic. It just complements the music and the scenery so well. All of it just goes together. Oh, I think you might be talking about Kalfu, where I yeah. have like really short hair and, and like going into the mountains. Oh, and yeah. And then there's, when the music changes, you're in the water. It's so oh, beautiful. my God. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was so fun making that. Like, it was really. I knew that I wanted to do it in Chile. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I'm from. So um, it was kind of like dream come true going there and being able to do that and going, I, literally going into the water. Like, I went into the river and 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 yeah, I got to spend a, a whole day in the mountains that I actually I didn't know that place before. I mean, it's in the mountains, like a few, like an hour away from Santiago, where I was born. Mm -hmm. um, but I hadn't been there. And it was wow, like my whole life, I was so close to this. And I never really experienced it. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Well, I would love to hear a bit about um, growing up in Chile. And when you started out playing guitar, and maybe some early influences that led you to seek a career in music. Yeah, definitely. So 
I would say I, I come from a musical family um, without necessarily having, you know, um, people before me that like dedicated their, their lives fully to, to music. Although I just, I mean, it's funny because like whenever you start digging into family stories, then suddenly like all these things come up that like you, you're like, how come I, I never knew this? So my grandmother, <laughs> she actually at a moment of her life, she toured Latin America singing tangos, wow. you know? which is something that for some reason wasn't talked too much when I was growing up, you know, um, or I guess it was always kind of more in, in a anecdotal way. Yeah, she loved singing kind of thing. But like she actually toured Latin America and there's like some newspapers with her, like, you know, touring uh, um, schedules and stuff like that. So that side of the family, which is my dad's side, is super musical. I mean, my grandfather also wrote music, same thing, kind of like not as a, as a, um, you know, I would say professional musician, which is weird. I mean, what makes you a professional musician, mm -hmm. but fully dedicated. That's what I, I would say. And then my dad studied composition and piano when he was young and then shifted to other things like philosophy and, and journalism. But music was always there, you know, like it, it, it's a it's a definitely a music a blood family, musical family. Like we're always singing. We're always like tapping, you know, like uh, tapping tables, the classic thing when you're in the kitchen and everybody's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> luckily, my mom is like super patient and she loves music. <laughs> so, but yeah. And so then I think I got very influenced by my siblings. Um, vibe you know i have two two older an older brother that's a drummer an older sister that at that time was um, play, um learning bass and then a younger sister that's eight years younger than me that also ended up like after after a while just like becoming a musician as well so my older brother and my sister they had a hang that i always remember so dearly because it's it's probably one of the reasons why I became a musician. I was so interested in it because they would sit right next to me. I was like at that moment, maybe playing with some toys or whatever, but they were a little older. So they were like, they were collecting this VHS, that's how you call it. Mm -hmm. Like this, you know, I mean, really 90s kids, you know, but like all these musicians from the States, you know, that the names at that moment sounded like brushless rails from this role, you know, like totally <laughs> like people that you don't understand who they are, or whatever. But like they they would have this music hang that they would put this uh, VHS, this live music clinics, you know, like I remember learning with that, like, mm -hmm. you know, people actually, you know, like musicians, famous musicians from the US making clinics and showing crazy chops and stuff. So that was something that i now that i remember like it really like made me want to be part of that hang you know mm -hmm. and um they were they were listening to like at that moment fusion was super like a big thing in chile um there's this i would say there's this moment in 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 jazz where like jazz musicians uh started just mixing stuff with rock and also honestly like opening their ears to Latin American rhythms and, and Latin American influences. And so maybe that was like a, an opening door to these other continents where like, now you say like, you're from Chile, how come you like, like jazz, you know? Well, this artist like sort of created this, this uh, bridge in a way, you mm -hmm. know? And I'm talking about people like Chick Corea, um, in in my case, Pat Metheny, I remember listening to Pat Metheny and like just, you know, being mind blown. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then and then because my brother is a drummer, like I got acquainted to so many drummers like early on, but, you know, like the fusion sort of like super virtuosic kind of uh, Vinicola Yuda, Dave Weckl and, you know, etc. So that was going on in my house and 
and there was never you know like uh one kind of music too you know there was always so much going on mm -hmm. my dad my dad can sing like mozart symphonies like from top to bottom like driving mm -hmm. uh you know my sister was bringing like folklore uh records so and then i also was super into i was getting into rock and i i heard when i heard Jimi hendrix i, I couldn't believe how incredible some human being could be mm -hmm. yeah all that it was like a melting pot for me uh and yeah we could keep going on with like a million influences that are also are super unrelated because like if i right. think also about like being 12 and i was listening to bjork uh you know and just like yeah yeah, yeah. so a lot of a lot going on when i was growing up totally and then singing came to you later is that right in college i think you said and then yeah that's interesting because um these years that i'm talking about like with my my siblings listening to all this like it was mostly like instrumental music that i was like more attracted to although i was singing um sort of naturally and intuitively since i can rem remember being a human being i have sung um but you see when you start you know when you're a teenager and then the you know you have to start thinking of what do you want to do with your life and all that like I definitely knew that I wanted to be a musician. That was like no doubt ever. Mm -hmm. But I actually never saw myself as a singer, you know, like I always saw myself as just a guitarist mm -hmm. and but a guitarist that could use her voice for communication. Basically, you know, mm -hmm. I used to have a band like a rock band in my teenage years. Um, called contrabanda like contraband <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> yeah i always say that if those videos surface the internet <laughs> it's going to be so hilarious <laughs> like i would headbang you know what i'm saying yeah. i would like literally headbang and just like yeah it was it was very interesting years and then but you know i would write music for the band and then sort of like express all my my ideas with the with my voice you know like oh yeah this is the melody and i would write music the same way that i write it now which is just singing and playing but i would do the background vocals you know i never thought of myself as like the leader and then suddenly like going into finally going and deciding to to do music school and going to a little music school in chile actually one of the few because at that moment it was really hard to actually study popular music you know, it was like very few options, like, and none of them, not none of them, but like, actually the one that I went to was not accredited by the Ministry of Education. So, so, it, you know, like you basically take a chance to just go super alternative right. education, you know, um, but in that school, I met some of some of my mentors that like changed my whole life, you know, um, uh, the particular, this one that the, it's a piano player and elder, elder, <laughs> an older musician. Um, he noticed that I, cause he, he was uh, ear training. He would do ear training classes. So, um, he sort of noticed that I had a, a voice, you know, when, you know, when you, you start singing your intervals as exercises in, in your class. You know, and he stopped me actually after class. He's like, he's like, do you sing? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I, uh, you know, I kind of said, no, I don't. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I kind of sing, but not professionally or again. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he's like, oh, okay, just learn these songs, you know, and he gave me a few standards. Actually, that was my first encounter to, to, you know, learning the beginning of what all of you guys learn, you know, like, I remember him giving me like songs like all of me, you know, and uh, Misty, like, mm -hmm. yeah, like all the all the classics, like learn, learn your first 10 songs. And then also some Bossa Novas. I remember like learning Desafinado and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And and so that's how it began me actually sort of discovering Camila, the singer. 
-hmm. Because first of all, I enjoyed so much learning this music, you know, and there was something different and finally something that like really clicked, which was the fact that, you know, I was, I would learn songs just by listening to records. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would luckily, I guess in our generation, I, we were already, I don't know if it was spot, uh, clearly not Spotify, but it was some kind of, of, um, platform where you could like download many versions. So I would like, you know, put all of me and then have like 15 different versions of a song, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I would do that like all day long, just like listen to so many versions of the same song and starting to understand what each person was doing with the same piece of music, which, mm -hmm. which was such a great school because I could, I could really understand the personality of each of these interpreters, you know, and I'm talking about, and that moment I, you know, I went deep into, you know, Ella and uh, Ella Fitzgerald and Chet Baker and Sarah Vaughan, Carmen McRae, you know, all these incredible singers. And that's how I learned. And I fell at home singing that way, you know, because I knew that yeah, I will learn the melody, but then eventually I could just play with it. You know? I can mm -hmm. just like shift it around and like play with the phrasing and, you know, and every time I could do it differently, that was where I wanted to be. Yeah. And so that was a, a, an amazing door opening for me in terms of understanding what I wanted to do because I knew kind of what jazz was, but not really, you know, like mm -hmm. I, I when whenever I'm kind of backing track on, you know, me listening to Pat Metheny or, or Chick Corea, like I when I realized that these guys were improvising and they were creating that stuff in the moment, I was shocked because mm -hmm. I thought that that might be, you know, kind of like a, a almost like a classical piece, but they sound really naughty and awesome and like free, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. But yeah, so so that understanding the jazz approach to music it was the best thing ever that could happen in my life. Mm -hmm. I have a really similar experience where I didn't identify as a singer and I just sang background vocals in a band and then in college you know same same kind of thing happened and it's so cool to have that like extra tool and means of expression. Would you say that like you now equally identify as a guitarist and a vocalist definitely yeah yeah um i this is a question that comes a lot you know but um i think that for me it has become almost like one instrument you know mm -hmm. and it, not that we, when i'm doing one or the other i feel uh, incomplete I think that I can still, you know, play uh, a guitar role in a particular piece and I would feel great. Mm -hmm. Same thing, just vocals and it's fine. But like my, the way that I conceive music and the way that I, I, I hear improvisation and the way that I hear um, um, my music in particular, uh, it's definitely this sound, you know, the mm -hmm. two together and and honestly, in terms of, of my own music education, it has just been an incredible um, privilege almost, you know, to be able to, as a singer, to always have this, this um, kind of like this platform where I can see notes, I can see colors, I can see... Um, harmonic progressions while I'm singing and, and everything becomes so clear and so full of possibility. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, when I'm playing, I cannot disconnect this part of my being. It's still sort of in the works and still sort of like putting that mel internal melody out there for the guitar to respond to it. So I, I early on when my fingers were just moving, you know, I could sense it. I could mm -hmm. sense it so easily. And it was hard because like, you know, to get to a level where you're like, <clears throat> at least you feel that like you're, you're playing things that are in your ear. It takes a while, you know, <laughs> it takes yeah. a while. Like there's a lot of memorization. 
you know, in the and at the very beginning of our process that that could deter you from connecting to that that you hear. Mm -hmm. But but it's been amazing. I mean, I'm I'm miles and hundreds of miles away from like really playing what I'm hearing. You know, I'm still like it's an endless work. But I feel closer. You know, I feel connected, which mm -hmm. makes making that music the funner funner. <laughs> yeah, and it's such a beautiful texture when you hear you your guitar solo with the vocal along with it. It's just like such a beautiful and unique. It brings so much to the music. It just adds that extra layer of. Yeah, that was something that um, er, at the very beginning I heard from George Benson. Um, George Benson would sing his lines and that was so insane. Like, especially because of where I come from, you know, kind of like putting the puzzle of this music together, like little by little, right? Mm -hmm. So understanding that it's improvised, all right, that's insane already. But then understanding that like, you can be so accurate with your ideas that you could sing every note that you're playing, that like was next level. So hearing George Benson do that was insane. And then I, you know, like another one of my favorite, um, uh, guitar players, Kurt Rosenwinkel, also sing his lines, and that's, you know, like also a very specific, very different sound too. Same kind of idea, but different vibe. And I'm like, whoa, this is, this is a, a, a it could be like a technique, you know, yeah. of, of, uh, of playing and instrumental music. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, I kind of wanted to get into some talking about some of your compositions and arranging. Maybe we'll start with um, Nectar Orchestra and deciding to write for string quartet and integrate that into your music. And I'd love to hear how that idea came about and how you got started doing that. Definitely. <clears throat> so I'm thinking, well, probably it's because I'm starting to miss New York so much. I'm thinking of New York and I'm thinking of the amount of possibility, you know, like I, it, that's something that like always feels irreplaceable, you know, like New York, whatever you imagine, it, it feels that like there's going to be musicians and there's going to be people down to do and experiment stuff. <clears throat> Plus, you know, that you get to meet people that are are in your own in your same vibe and like are, are into like creating and experimenting and, and doing things sometimes just for the sake of doing them you know like not necessarily with any more um ambition than just to make music and so that's how this project started and in particular the idea of um of strings I'm thinking it was sort of like a, not just one reason, but there were like a few of things colliding. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them was the fact that like one of my best friends and at that time <clears throat> we were like, you know, going to all the little gigs of New York restaurant scene. <laughs> Colin might, might know that era so well. Um, so Noam Weisenberg, bass player, <clears throat> yeah, we used to just like have five day tours of like, you know, little little venues and restaurants in New York. And so in all that like time spent, you know, we also were like, oh, why don't we just like try and, and you know, and experiment with a string quartet. In his case, he comes from a, an arranging fam, an arranger, a family of arrangers. Mm -hmm. That is an arranger. And so he was motivated to kind of put put his practice onto something, you know. And on my in my case, there was this sound that I was like craving, you know. Um, I don't know if chronologically one thing is after the other, but at that moment, around that time, I also started working with uh, the uh, Q this. Um, piano player from Cuba called Fabian Almason. I don't know if you guys know if you don't, you have to. So he started a band called uh, Rhizome and it's kind of similar, like a, a piano trio with a string quartet. Mm -hmm. And 
just the experience of like singing on top of of that bed of sound and that you know the the um, and the amount of um possibility in terms of texture and layers which is kind of two concepts that i am obsessed with when it comes to music mm -hmm. um it was endless you know um and so we started with one song it was kind of like okay let's just do one song uh, and see what happens and and so we picked a song by this amazing folklore singer called Elliot Smith and oh, yeah oh my god <laughs> yeah I, I I'm in love too and his music has always gotten me like oh, so deep that all right so we started there there's a song called Waltz Number One and that was the first song that we did and there's actually like a, a a memory in youtube because we uploaded a video we did like a video you know kind of like having fun with it mm -hmm. and it's still there and we it's hilarious because like now you look at it and it's literally it's been seven eight years something like that and we're all like babies <laughs> you look at it. every member of the band's like a baby and then you you see how beautiful also you know the per kind of like the the persisting into like a group of people and and like a an idea so that was great although it took us forever to make an album like we ended up coming up with like a lot of music for that project and so yeah the strings come from that and also you know like this is more an, an abstract answer because i'm not really sure but like i have you know my my dad listening to so much classical music when I was growing up there, you know, there has to be some kind of familiarity with certain sounds and even some, some pop and rock music that I love, like a lot of these albums that are, you know, have this, this uh, support as a, as a, as a sound, as a, as a texture. So yeah, it was a combination of all those things and and I had, at that moment, I had been playing mostly with a quartet. So piano, bass, drums. So it was awesome to kind of like change the, the palette of mm -hmm. colors. Oh man, the waltz number one arrangement is so beautiful. Everyone go oh listen. And listen to, <laughs> yeah, everyone who doesn't listen to Elliot Smith, go listen to Elliot Smith too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, I would love to hear you talk more when you mentioned texture and layers, maybe how you approach a piece and the importance of getting different textures and how you go about doing that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so <clears throat> I'm trying to think in terms of composition and arranging and if there's anything there that differs. I guess like when it comes to arranging my own tunes, you know, this this definitely comes into into the the process. I first of all when I write I I hear a lot kind of individual lines, you know. Uh, believe it or not, there's a lot of uh, of um, bass lines, you know, that like come <laughs> even before sometimes. Um, harmony which you would say that oh you're a guitarist so like mm -hmm. yeah sometimes there's yeah there's this lines this bass lines these grooves that kind of like start <clears throat> um igniting that whole the whole like creative process uh let's say kalfu you know that the song that uh, on the river and in the mountains so that song actually um I conceived it with uh, with the idea of a texture, you know. Mm -hmm. I and it was great because I, I, we were at the very end of the process of uh, of making, you know, finishing the repertoire for the album. We were like actually maybe two months before the recording session. So, you know, this is one of the songs that come out kind of like out of the pressure of like, yeah, you know, like let's yeah. make a song that has some this kind of like vibe and then because you have this deadline then you know like the it kind of comes out so in this particular song like i wanted to this is this was the conversation that i was having with noam because like we we 
we work in we worked and we work in a very collaborative way you know kind of uh you know back and forth and then giving ideas and then oh what about this and then what about that so this particular song i was imagining a very sort of like um ostinato kind of uh use of the strings and in that sense also kind of giving the strings a different kind of role instead of sort of like the the harmonic layer of you know just playing chords and 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 you know beautiful melodies this particular song i wanted it to be rhythmic i wanted it to be um sort of um kind of motif with little motifs and in my mind it honestly it was uh 18 musicians for for like uh, steve reich 18 musicians uh, what is it music for 18 musicians yeah mm -hmm. okay so i was obsessed with that album for you know for all that time and then there was something about the development of a motif and then the overlapping and i wanted to do that you know like at the very at the very beginning i was calling actually this song the reich song and so that whole thing kind of had that in mind and 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 developed with that with a texture in mm -hmm. mind and on the other hand it has another section that is the sort of the contrast where it's you know kind of more um like longer notes and so yeah like that's an example of a song that was developed with the texture in mind there's um yeah there's <clears throat> depending on also on the arrangement of the song you know but but for me whenever i listen to 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 these certain albums that i love i realize that i love them so much because it could be my 15th time listening to it and i discover something new mm -hmm. you know yeah. there's this layer that i had not heard you know, and then suddenly there's like this awareness of something different within it. And then I realized, oh, there's that little bell, like bling, 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 bling. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, that's a, such a detail. It's such like, it's, it's like so loving, you know, kind of like, I'm just going to do that little thing there because it's, um, uh, you know, like a, like a garden and just like taking care of every little flower that comes out, you know? Mm -hmm. So beautiful yeah so that i i love that in sound and 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 it's fun too you know yeah sometimes i know exactly what i mean there'll be like a moment in a song that i love the whole song for that one little moment and it's just <laughs> one of those little yeah little flowers yeah. garden i know exactly what you mean definitely so on i was reading a little bit like an interview i think you did with downbeat and you mentioned that a couple of the tunes were written pretty like a pretty long time ago like a decade ago and that you said that they needed the right circumstances to bloom and that you had been a little too critical I and I think that's something we all run into is that inner critic um certainly like as a composer myself like I find things I wrote that I hated 10 years ago and now I make it into something and I was wondering if you could talk about how you like overcome the inner critic or how you are more gentle with yourself about not judging what you write if you have any advice about that i have a crazy story of like a writer's block honestly um because i would say that i was growing up an innate songwriter an innate composer part of my of my identity as a musician when i was growing up just writing music and and making songs like i remember making songs when i was eight mm -hmm. and writing lyrics and you know feeling super empowered about that aspect of 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 creation you know and then as i grew up and i started like learning more music and sort of like going into the 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 academy side of of our um doing uh, i started yeah i started getting like super judgmental like um at a point where 
I would start a song and before I had the second chord, I would immediately had said, no, this is, this is not as good as, or this is, this is too like this, or this is not like, oh, the amount of voices in my head. Mm -hmm. So for literally for, uh, I would say six years, maybe somewhere seven years, I wrote three tunes, you know? Mm -hmm. Which is nuts because like, you know, if I see back and then I, I see the joy and, 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 and the curiosity from when I started playing music, it's like, whoa, why did you lose that? But it made sense. I mean, I was, I was learning from, you know, the, the best music ever, the most amazing composers ever. And it's hard, you know, like it's hard to not put your little song against all those things that you consider as being the greatest music. Mm -hmm. But so I, I personally had to go through like a life crisis <laughs> to actually um, start understanding actually why I was doing what I, I was doing, why I was doing music. And without going into too much detail, it was basically a moment where everything like crumbles down your whole life suddenly it's not like your life you know like you everything is upside down and then you're there questioning everything you know and questioning why you even do music you know mm -hmm. and the depth of this questioning was so deep that it took me to places where, where I, I could finally see so clear, you know, and one of the things that I definitely learned from that experience was that making music for me was, was almost like, um, like um it had therapeutical um characteristics you know mm -hmm. and when i realized that i realized because i started writing again and the way that i would feel by putting all those emotions into sound it was so amazing mm -hmm. that i started like treating myself so much better just by understanding that this is it's a personal first before i show these songs to you and before i i i i i, I get to see if they're good enough for anybody they are my own little experience you know personal experience in my room mm -hmm. that help me understand myself better you know and whoa i mean with that in mind like i started like it's almost like i i took like a you know like when the the rivers are like they have a, a dam or something i did this like and then the the river started like really flowing and not to not to say that you know like from then on i was never judgmental about my work no way you know i i still i mean it's actually to be honest, you should never get rid of that because that that part of, of, of yourself helps you in the process. You know, like, you know, like there is the person that creates and the, there's the person that like puts the things together and say like, oh, you know what, that this is too long. That's the same guy that could tell you, oh, you know, this is really bad, mm -hmm. but use it for uh, a good purpose not like you know uh, a detrimental purpose of like stopping the process no this person has a role which is to judge for you to keep going right but you need to keep going for actually for this guy to actually be making his his job if he's stopping you from like keep writing it's not uh you should fire him or her <laughs> yeah so so yeah that realization for me was what like the depth of my coming back to the practice you know like um my album two albums before 
yeah well there's this album called traces that was like the very beginning of that process mm -hmm. you know those were the songs that i wrote after years of no not writing mm -hmm. and yeah and i you know it's a personal note but i remember one of the first songs that i wrote for that album is called away and i remember crying during the process because i was it was that constant like it was kind of the beginning of the of the dam kind of mm -hmm. like you know breaking so there were there were like back and forth you know and i i was doing that exactly what you say like i was judging myself and then i was like no i need to keep going and then i couldn't get to that that c-section i wanted that c-section and i couldn't understand where it should go and i was you know, like a mad scientist, like, go! Oh. <laughs> but I got it, and it was one of the most amazing feelings to actually keep going so convincingly and so hard and so persistent and stubborn that you get that out. You feel like, like, a, yeah, I don't know. It feels so powerful. Yeah. So, yeah, we got to, we got to, push you know whenever it gets harder that's when you need to push mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i had such a similar experience like at the beginning of the pandemic and a lot of stuff just kind of collapsing in my personal life and in the world obviously and i was just coming out of my master's in composition and jazz composition and i had been writing music for people people other than myself you know and i the pandemic gave me the time to do kind of what you're talking about and realize why I do it. And I, I can totally relate to your story. It's so nice to hear about your experience. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's awesome. <clears throat> that's awesome because then your roots will be so deep that like, I mean, the music life is, first of all, it's not, con it's not consistent. It's not, uh, I mean, you have like things back, I mean, just there's so many reasons why to feel discouraged, you know, at certain points. And there's so many reasons why to go and say like, why am I doing this? But then when your roots are, you know, are so deep on why and and, and how much you love it eventually and, and discovering that, that like, I mean, we could, yeah, exactly. We could be in the middle of like the craziest time of our, our lifetimes <laughs> and and be like, yeah, I'm gonna wake up every morning and still do a little bit of music, you know, do this and like be curious about learning this and listening to this record. Oh my God, so good. And then, you know, keep going the way that you can. Well, speaking of listening to stuff, have you been inspired by anything recently, jazz or otherwise that you keep coming back to? Yeah, uh, I've been, let me see. So. <clears throat> in a very unorganized way, unorganized, not organized. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I've been I've been digging like various various uh, different albums, and I've been kind of also going to uh, types of music, types of music, or or you know, kind of genres or whatever that like I hadn't. For some reason i don't know why like given in like so much time or but but that i'm like equally um interested in i've been listening to um to bach uh i've been also just it depends on also like what are you like depending on your on your day and what are you doing but um i don't know if you guys know francis bebe like there's a record that it, I mean, I need to write names because I'm really bad at remembering names. But <clears throat> I was totally digging that the other day. Um, and uh, what else? I've been checking out, also going kind of like to records of people that I love that I haven't heard, which is awesome because, mm -hmm. you know, then you realize like, how is it possible that I hadn't heard this if I love this person so much? So I was going into some really um, old records. I mean, old meaning like when she was super young, uh, Elis Regina, the Brazilian singer. Mm -hmm. And I discovered this, uh, she was like 19 years old when she, she was uh, recording this 
with an orchestra. And it was so amazing because at the very beginning, I was like, is, is, is this her? Because I, you know, like her voice was different and, and her inflections even were, were, you know, not necessarily that um, kind of developed as it was going to be Elise Regina. And seeing that process, it's amazing to understand the whole evolution of an artist, right? And it almost helps you um, see yourself too, in, in the sense of like, we have so many years of development, you know, we have so many years to, to become ourselves, you know, <laughs> and, and yeah, I find it very fascinating, you know, to, to see and understand like, that we, we keep evolving and keep changing. Um, I'm going deeper also into Latin American repertoire because I'm, I'm interested in doing maybe something in relationship with so many songs that I have in my head mm -hmm. that I haven't necessarily put into uh, any context. So I've been also sort of like listening, I've been listening to a lot of Latin American stuff too. Um, yeah, the list goes on. <laughs> wow, this is breezing by. We're almost at an hour already. This is just so fun. Are you serious? Yeah, isn't that crazy? <laughs> oh my God, it, it went really fast, I have I to say. <laughs> I do want to encourage any audience members, if you have questions, we always like to take a couple of those. If not, I have a bunch more. Um, well, one thing I always ask everyone that we do these interviews with is what advice you would give to a young musician who is just starting out, maybe learning about improvising or composing, any advice that you've learned or that would have helped you or so something that someone told you that stuck with you? Yeah, I would say that if you're starting um, now, remember, and I guess this, I heard it from older musicians as well, and now I'm like starting to see why they said this, but like, this is, this is the time for you to go like spend hours and hours embedding yourself in music and getting nerd about everything and being with your instrument for hours. Nobody, I mean, eventually some, I know that some young musicians still have to work and, you know, get a job and whatever, but, you know, use this time to really, um, really focus on music, you mm -hmm. know? Like, I know there's so many distractions today. I actually hurt for, for younger musicians in that realm, you know, like you can get so swayed away, you know, with so many things that like society is ask, asking from you right now. Mm -hmm. So if you can try to um, make your practice and your music time a sacred space, you know, and your little temple, you know, just this is the moment where you connect with yourself and you work on yourself. Music will reveal so many aspects of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, before you have to go to a psychologist, before you have to go, just make music, you know, and, and concentrate on the music because music will help you in, in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this time is precious, basically. Don't don't waste it. Um, take advantage of this time for sure. Well, is there anything that you have in the works that we can look forward to hearing on the horizon? Yes. Or anything uh, well, <laughs> I still need to figure out the logistics because this is uh, definitely the year of logistics. Um, but I uh, got... Um, a Chilean grant to record my next album. And I think that I need to put out the music that I wrote for a jazz gallery commission in New York. I wrote an hour of music that's called Portal. Portal. And honestly, it's, it's so strange because I wrote it in 2018 and so many things that we're experiencing they are there lyrically 
Mm. So it really feels that it's it's like uh, music for today, and I need to put it out. And um, also because it's a hopeful message, and I think we need that, you yes. know. Um, so yeah, I would. I'll keep you guys posted, but I'm thinking of recording this year. I'm hopefully just putting that music out there as soon Yay. as possible. And also, <laughs> I hope once you can tour again and everything, I really hope to catch you coming through Denver or something so we can all connect. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much, guys. Colin, this was so much fun. Thank That's you for having so me. Amazing. Thank you for and being And Camila, here. you're great. Thank you. Oh, you too. This has been so fun. Yeah, awesome. Um, and then just for everyone to keep you up to date with what's coming up next week on Sunday, I'll be interviewing Peter Bernstein, 5 p.m. here on Zoom. Amazing. We've had a crazy guitar month. It's been amazing. Woo! And then- Guys are lucky. Yeah, and then in May, the first one will be with Rudy Royston. So we've got some cool ones coming up. Perfect. Uh, and then this Wednesday, just to finish my little spiel, this Wednesday, we have a composition class with Don Clement also on Zoom at 7 p.m. So I hope you guys can keep checking these out and I hope you all stay healthy and I wish you guys the best as we go into the warmer season too. Uh, thank you, Camila. This was just lovely. Thank really you all so much. It was my pleasure. Time. You too. Bye-bye.